So good afternoon, everyone. I guess we may be live. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it is. So um, hello to everybody who's joining us. I can see the numbers going up as we're um, sitting here. Uh, just to say uh, welcome, uh, a very warm welcome uh, to everybody. Uh, I'm Janet Lindsay from uh, Wellbeing of Women. And I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to be hosting this webinar uh, and to have two such fabulous guest speakers. Um, so joining me today is Savania Raja Gangaram and also Dr. Satiria Saravelos. Um, and rather than me introduce uh, them, I would really like them to introduce themselves if they wouldn't mind. So maybe Savania. Hi everyone, my name is Savania. I'm a dentist by qualification. I'm really passionate about healthcare. After three years of practicing in South Africa as a clinician, I then transitioned into strategy consulting. I'm passionate about how global healthcare systems work and how they affect end users. I have a particular passion for women and healthcare and making good quality information highly accessible so end users have agency and autonomy um, to information that affects their bodies. Lovely, thank you. And uh, Dr. Saraf Saravellas, please, will you do the same? Thank you so much. So good afternoon to you and everyone who's joining us. My name is Soterios Saravellos. I have a difficult Greek name. Um, I am one of the consultants at Imperial College NHS Trust, and I am a consultant in reproductive medicine. So that means all things associated with fertility and fertility and miscarriages. Um, and it's a pleasure to join this webinar where hopefully we will be able to share some stories, but some information about fertility and how it can affect us, not only medically, but when it comes to other aspects of life, work and many others. So um, it's a real pleasure and thank you for the invitation. Oh, no, I'm, I'm really <laughs> delighted to, to be sharing this webinar with you both. Um, so for those of you who perhaps don't know um, anything about well-being of women, I will just briefly uh, tell you. So we are the only uh, charity uh, in the UK working in women's health across the whole life course. Um, we've been going since 1964, uh, so we're well established. Um, we're probably best known for um, funding research um, into women's health. And in fact, I'm uh, really uh, excited to hear that we actually funded um, uh, Satirius um, uh, some years ago. Um, and actually, it it's, didn't change his life course, but it certainly took him uh, to somewhere that perhaps he wasn't expecting. Um, but we've done a, a lot of um, research into uh, fertility um, and trying to uh, improve outcomes for people. Um, but we're now embarking on education and um, advocacy. And I was um, uh, delighted to hear Savania talk about the importance of making sure that um, uh, women um, and all people have access to really good um, evidence based information about their own health. And many of you will have uh, perhaps seen our uh, Menopause Workplace Pledge campaign, which we've been running for a year now. Um, and we'll be doing many more uh, of those uh, different types of, of campaigns to really try and drive progress in uh, women's health. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, the webinar is being recorded um, and uh, we would like you to um, post any comments and questions you have in the chat function that um, you will find um, at the uh, bottom. Um, so what I'd really like to do is begin the conversation. Um, touching on Savania's experience um, and then um, Satirius will uh, join in with um, various different um, facts about um, fertility. So um, perhaps I could ask Savania to um, share um, her story with all of us. Um, uh, I hope you um, uh, will listen um, intently. It's a, it, it is a, a, a really difficult story to hear, but it's one that I think is very important to share. So if I could hand over to you, Savanya. 
Thank you so much for providing me with this opportunity. My name is Savanya, and my fertility journey started in 2020. My husband and I were ready to start a family, and after a year of crying, we began to consult several gynecologists. I was surprised when, my when I was diagnosed with severe endometriosis. Many of the signs of endometriosis can be classed as normal. In addition to endometriosis, I also had a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome. After my laparoscopic surgery, which removed large endometriomas, I was able to proceed with the IVF process. We were able to retrieve 33 eggs, of which only nine survived, and very glad to let you know that one of those eggs has started to walk. The process was not straightforward. When you look online, the process does look very linear and very quick, but IVF is not a quick journey. IVF is a difficult journey, and there's an abundance of information out there. Prior to going through IVF, I really thought it would be quick. I thought within one to two, maybe three months, I would be pregnant, and it didn't work out like that. I lost a twin pregnancy at, twin, at 10 weeks and another singleton pregnancy after that. It took me almost eight months to a year to fall pregnant. I did six embryo transfers and can't emphasize enough how important it is to be transparent with those around you and ensure that you have a strong support system to get through this. I didn't tell anyone. I was ashamed of having to use IVF to fall pregnant. And I want everyone to know that there's nothing to be ashamed about. What we're talking about today is biology and it affects our bodies and we need to start normalizing these topics. In addition to the challenges faced around IVF, my son had a cardiac anomaly called a left persistent superior vena cava, LPSBC. And no, I had no idea what that meant because they don't teach us that in dental school. Um, and that was diagnosed while I was eight months off being pregnant. At this point, the doctors weren't sure if it was an anomaly or associated with a genetic disorder. We then proceeded and were advised to do an amniocentesis with a chance of going into preterm labor. And we were then given the option of completing a late termination based on that diagnosis, which I was not ready for. And I went through all of this without telling anyone, which I don't think is a good idea. Um, we then had the results of the amniocentesis, which were normal, um, and we then proceeded through the pregnancy. But all through the pregnancy, I was always anxious. I was always worried that I was going to lose this pregnancy like I lost previous ones. I want everyone to know that infertility, infertility affects both men and women of varying ages. I refuse to suffer in silence, and I refuse to be silenced by things that are considered taboo. I think we need to pass that. As a woman in the workforce, I want to do everything that I can to support other women and ensure that my voice and the role that I play is a positive one. I want to make sure that good quality information is accessible and women are afforded the agency, information and accessibility to make the best decisions possible for their lives and their bodies. There are many myths out there, such as drinking pomegranate juice or exercising too much. And it is important that you use information and data that is of the highest quality. There is no magic wand, but we can use science to help navigate the challenges around infertility. And we can use each other to support each other through this difficult journey. I'm gonna hand over back to you, Janet, and Dr. Sarah Bellos, if you'd like to dig deeper into any of those questions. So um, I guess from my end, uh, Savannah, I'd just like to thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I think it is not only incredibly brave, but I think impact of people such as yourself sharing their own personal journey is as important as research that's done through funding with well-being of women or the clinical work that I do in the hospital day in, day out, because uh, other people being informed and other people feeling that they're not alone is, is so important. And I think there'll be... Um, there'll be different groups of people who are listening to us. I think some will hear your story and they'll say, oh my God, I'm not alone. You know, I've had a similar journey or I feel like I'm having a similar journey. And, you know, your journey had a happy ending. Like you said, that that egg is now walking around and yeah. making you happy. And um, I think 
uh, similarly, there might be other people who won't know of this at all, and they'll say, wow, I joined this webinar to hear a bit about fertility, and there's so much I don't know, and so much more I'd like to know. So, um, uh, yeah, I think your, your input is uh, incredibly valuable. Um, I guess we could start a conversation and, you know, Janet, let me know as well yeah. what you think in terms of which points we should touch yeah. upon. Firstly, I think most people ask how common uh, fertility struggles are and the, yeah. the most quoted figures um, we were saying together, Janet, are about one in six to one in seven couples. So it is so much more common than than people think. Um, it is highly related to age um, and particularly maternal age so the older women are the higher the chance that they will have fertility struggles now in the past that caused a bit of trouble because if someone was young and was struggling they'd say oh you need to try longer or you're not trying hard enough or we'll come back and see us in a year or two and now i'm very glad to say that with um with more education and insight, um, we know that there are some conditions that don't you know, discriminate in terms of age, they can affect any age. So this is not, um, this is not a problem that affects only older women. I think the second thing is now we have some research showing that um, male uh, age as well, men's age can have an impact as well. So we shouldn't forget the, the male side too. Um, so it is commoner than we think, or than most of us would think, and uh, there are, you know, a lot of different causes. I think, Savania, you, you touched upon endometriosis and polycystic ovaries, but if you'd like, we could expand on some of those. I think that uh, we've already had some questions, which is, um, uh, which is great. Please um, keep putting them in there. I think one of the, the questions that um, young women um probably need to think about is when 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 should people start to think about um their fertility um satirious when but uh, and uh and what should they do about it if they because we've got people here who are saying that they you know they're not ready to have a family yet but how do they know that uh when they start a, a family later on i think that's always a difficult question and there's been talk of egg freezing in fact we've done yeah. a, a very good webinar on egg freezing um and savania you uh, obviously your story touches on it that you know ivf you know a, a lot of people think is a is the sort of answer and it doesn't always lead to um to having a, a baby. So uh, maybe if we could sort of touch on some of those aspects. Yeah, for sure. I, I think um, one important thing to emphasize, which we touched upon is, is age. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of women, and it breaks my heart, in clinic, they will say, if I had known, you know, this fact, uh, I would have, you know, I would have gone differently about my daily life or my plans um, without wanting to be overly dramatic or stress people out medically or scientifically um, the chances of um, of conception start declining probably from the mid 30s so from 35 onwards um, the reason behind that is that women are born with all the number of eggs that they will have in their lifetime so they may genuinely have about a million eggs when they're born. And year on year, the number of eggs um, start to decline. Um, the longer or the, the older someone is, the more almost genetically unstable these eggs may become. So it becomes more difficult to conceive. There's also conditions like endometriosis, like Savania mentioned, but other conditions like fibroids that actually develop with age as well. Now, that doesn't mean that we should all try to have a baby super early in life, but after the age of 35, um, the, ch the, the chances of conceiving start to drop a little bit. So that may mean that someone may take a more proactive approach. So if they're trying for maybe six months after the age of 35 and nothing's happened, they could seek help through a GP. Um, if it's over a year, and I think that's where we can add in the definition of infertility, the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, 
comments that the definition of infertility is when you're trying to conceive for a year with no success. So even under the age of 35, you should seek help if you're not conceiving uh, after a year. I think something else to remember is we, we shouldn't be stuck with all the recommendations and guidelines. They are there to guide us. So if someone has a condition, uh, for example, a male partner has no sperm, there's no, there's no point in trying for a year. Or if someone has severe endometriosis um, where their tubes may be blocked, then they don't need to try for a year. They should seek, seek help earlier. So it should be individualized. And I think something else is there's now more education about other conditions that affect fertility. And I think that is something that can make, make a difference. If someone is earlier on in life and that they've had a condition that may impact on their fertility, then knowing about that and educating themselves or through healthcare professionals can lead to a kind of happy ending, really, in terms of, um, of having a family. Thank you, Satirius. I'm now going to uh, introduce um, Leslie, uh, the Chair of Wellbeing of Women. Uh, Professor Dame Leslie Regan, thank you for joining us, Leslie. I hope your back is better. Um, and I will let you pick up on this webinar now, um, which I'm sure Savania and Satirius are very welcome. Um, so um, I will uh, do what uh, Len has done and I will just hide my face, but we were really just um, touching there on age and, and fertility. Okay, I'll, I'll step back now and hand over to you, Leslie. Thank you very much, Janet. I mean, one of the reasons I love working for well-being of women or being their chair is that it's such a great team. You see, you could just ring Janet with a few minutes to spare and say, can you warn them? I'm going to be a little bit late. And of course, uh, for those of you who are joining us on the platform today, now is my opportunity to welcome Sivania with her very poignant story. And we're so grateful to you for talking to us about it. And also my colleague, I'm very proud to say my consultant colleague, Satiria Saravelos, who came uh, to work with me at the Imperial when he was a very junior trainee and has now lasted the test of time and is now my consultant colleague and we're all very excited about him joining us because he's going to bring such quality and uh, richness to our fertility services so Savania have you thought can you sort of share with us the thing that disturbed you most about the journey I mean I've uh, your your beautifully narrated story is so impressive and so moving but what was the thing that you as a woman or as a professional or which bit do you think it really uh, distressed you most um well I think it that's such a hard question to answer but I think it would have to be two things firstly it was the amount of information that was available um and and I started doing you know I'm I'm a dentist and I'm supposed to be a rational clinician, but at that point, I was not rational at all. I sort of read somewhere that I should drink hibiscus tea. So I searched for hibiscus tea until I found it because I thought that was going to improve my um, improve the lining of my uterus. I stopped exercising because I thought if I exercise too much, I'm going to reduce my chances. And the second part of it was the anxiety throughout the process. So online, no one ever talks about how difficult it is to administer an injection on yourself and the continuous repetitive nature of, you know, keep failing, keep trying, keep failing, keep trying. That, that type of anxiety, I, I don't think I was fully prepared for. Yes, and I often see, say to the patients that I see who come to for me for advice, that uh, there's an enormous cost to fertility treatment and I don't just mean financial but also physical and emotional uh, costs yeah they're very very difficult it's very difficult to explain to somebody else isn't it how you feel about it although I'm sure that many people joining us on the platform today who've been through this journey um, whatever the outcome will really empathize with what you're saying um, you also talked I think very eloquently when we spoke previously about what it was like to be a working woman and to need to try and prioritise this part. And that's something I feel very strongly about as the Women's Health Ambassador for England at the moment, that we've got to make sure that these issues that trouble women are talked about at work and that we encourage employees and in their employers to actually be understanding and recognise that this is such an important 
a part of a woman's life that they need to help facilitate it and they mustn't think short term about oh goodness she won't be at work because she'll be off doing this or she'll be off being pregnant they've got to think about the overall contribution that women make so Savani, what you know you're a dentist so you may even be self-employed I suppose but how did you deal with all that so I think for me personally um and I don't think I dealt with it well um I didn't share my journey. I wasn't transparent about having to administer injections. And I fully agree with you, but we also play a role in being transparent with not just our um, where we work, but um, our support systems. And it's really important, um, you know, before we want to change policy to actually be the change that we want to see. Um, so for me, when I reflect back on my own journey, um, I went through a lot in terms of the number of miscarriages, the number of failed attempts, um, having to do six embryo transfers, um, moving appointments really late or really early. So I wouldn't have to tell anyone so I could sneak off and do it. Um, and I personally don't believe that's the right way to do things. I think what we're talking about today is biology. We're talking about things that happen to our body and you are absolutely spot on when you say it needs to be recognized. I want to say that there's no shame in saying that I have this medical issue. It is a medical issue and I need time off and to be transparent about that. Um, and we have a role as women um, to start those narratives, to reframe that conversation. And if I could do something differently, I would be kinder to myself and I would be more transparent. That's very powerful, isn't it? Kinder to myself and more transparent. And by saying this on this platform as well, Suvania, you're going to give an enormous empowerment to so many women uh, and men possibly as well, because they were maybe able to much better understand what their contribution is to making the journey slightly easier. Um, Soturios, can I ask you, what are the things that you'd like to pick up about Suvania's journey that you feel that we can get better and that well-being of women can really make a stand about? I think um, touching upon the latest point about awareness and um, the impact it has on work and the workplace. Uh, there, there are really some very compelling studies um, and surveys that have shown that about a third of um, women or couples going through treatment considered leaving their job during treatment, which is incredible. About half of them said that they felt the stress was similar to losing a, a, close, rel a close relative or you know, severe bereavement, which is also incredible. And a bit like Sylvania, you mentioned, two thirds like Sylvania didn't feel comfortable in, in telling their line manager or their employer. And, uh, you know, I'm so grateful to Savannah for speaking up and being brave to, to share her story and say that actually I think we should speak openly about this, because I think that's definitely the way forward. Uh, there's literally recently been a, a bill which is undergoing second reading. Last Friday was the second reading, and that's Fertility Treatment Employment Rights Bill. It's literally in Parliament, and it talks all about that. There's no law in place at the moment um, regarding fertility treatment per se. Having said that, everyone and every medical professional would agree that it should be treated like any other appointment. If you've uh, go if you've broken a leg or you're going to a clinic there or you have diabetes or you have an eye appointment it, there should be no difference and no one should feel embarrassed about going to fertility appointments there is some protection at the moment which I think very few people I don't think a lot of my colleagues know as well for anyone undergoing fertility treatment from the time of embryo transfer up until two weeks after the pregnancy test even if it's negative, they are covered by pregnancy protection. Any appointment sick leave go under the umbrella of a pregnancy sick leave. And of course, if there if there's anything to if anything were to go wrong from an employment point of view, it would be viewed as a period of pregnancy, even if the treatment's unsuccessful, which has been a step forward. But I think we've got much more to look forward to. Well, Satiris, you raise a very important point, and I'm now going to uh, recruit you to write a piece for our website about that <laughs> so that people can access that really valuable information because they may yeah. not be aware of it, and I think that's important. 
Now, I've got a couple of questions in the chat and feel free, Suvania, to butt in or Satirios if you'd like to raise other issues. But there's a lot of questions about accessing fertility treatment and the postcode lottery for IVF. And I would have been surprised if those questions hadn't come up because I think it is very disturbing. So as you know, Comma, depending on where you live, um, can determine whether you're eligible for NHS treatment and they have different criteria, different age cutoffs um, and different, uh, if you like, personal characteristics which they will accept or not accept. Um, one of the things that the Women's Health Strategy for England is promoting uh, and one of the, uh, one of the, the uh, advances that they're hoping to implement swiftly is to address this and to try and take away, if you like, the non-medical uh, criteria uh, that so many women seem to face as barriers. Um, but at the moment, uh, there are enormous changes. I mean, uh, I remember talking to a, a lady not so long ago who was explaining to me that if she lived on the other side of her street, she would be eligible for treatment. But because the postcode changed on her side of the street, she wasn't eligible. So, Zivani, you probably talked to lots of um, fellow fertility um, patients when you were attending your treatments and in your during your journey, what, what stories did they tell you and which did you think were the most inequitable, shall we say? Um, so, so Professor, I think for me, I had my treatment done in South Africa. Um, I am from South Africa originally, and then I moved here seven months pregnant. Uh, so the South African healthcare system is quite different. It is more privatized. Um, so the treatment that I had access to was private. When I did come here, um, I do have a lot of colleagues and friends that have used IVF within the system. Um, and you're absolutely right. The postcode lottery um, is one of the largest challenges. Also, the inaccessibility to information, people not really realizing, like Dr. Sarah Velos said, um, that had, had they known earlier, they would have made different changes. And some of the more difficult, um, difficult challenges were experienced during COVID. So having um, been diagnosed with severe endometriosis, not being able to remove that and that impacting um, their outcomes in fertility, as well as just generally how COVID impacted the healthcare system. Thank you. And so, uh, so, so um, Soterios, I'm going to uh, ask you if you'd like to um, expand for the audience answers to some of their questions. So one of the questions is how useful is fertility testing for those trying to establish how much of a hurry they need to be in to start a family? I'm thinking of the blood hormone and ultrasound tests. And I think this is a very, very important um, question to raise. And thank you, Isabel, for doing so, because I think so often um, these blood test results, all the scan reports, make people or make women think that there's a black and white answer to their question. And of course, the thing about fertility is that you never know whether you're fertile until you are pregnant and you never know that you're infertile until you, you know, can no longer become pregnant. So it's, it's not, it's a very gray area, but Satirius, what, what do you think is the best way to advise um, women who are trying to gauge what they should be doing um, and, but ensuring that they're, they're not too reliant on a proxy marker Yes, it's a really great question, um, especially now in the industry and online, there are various tests available that you can send via post and, you know, try and assess your level of fertility and what that means. And some offer support and interpretation, but uh, one has to be very careful that they don't end up having wrong information or causing more stress to themselves than otherwise. Um, Blood tests and ultrasound scans can help assess fertility. Uh, the most difficult aspect is the interpretation by far, because many times, and uh, I know, Prof, we talk about it at work, when you, when you ask for a test, you need to ask yourself first what, what you would do with the answer or what you would do with the result. Um, there are also many things that can affect the results. So I have seen very frequently young women being told that their so-called ovarian reserve is low or they've had an ultrasound scan and their ovaries are small and they don't have follicles and they won't be able to have a baby. 
And in fact, they've been on the contraceptive pill. Simple as that. And, you know, simple, simple facts such as these can alter the results. And someone on a contraceptive pill, it may make their ovary smaller and follicles not appear as um, as large. And once they're off the contraceptive pill, then everything looks normal again. I think I would urge people to try and follow the formal advice. So once if you've been trying for a year and you're less than 35, then you should seek formal help and have formal assessments and speak to a fertility specialist who will be able to answer all your questions and interpret the results. If you're over 35, you can seek help earlier after six months. And if you have a pre-existing condition, then you can ask for help sooner. And I think part of these uh, events and these, uh, you know, part of providing extra education is if you come across any barrier you should stand up for yourself and you should say no I'm not too young to be trying for a baby or I know that you know I need further testing after this amount of period and and you sometimes you feel when you're across someone who has authority that you shouldn't argue with them but you shouldn't argue but you can point them towards um certain information and certain resources and 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 you can make them kind of help you when you feel that you're not being helped yes and, and i i would add to that that any any doctor that doesn't um welcome challenge from their patients and from the ladies they're looking after is really not worth them their weight in salt uh, i shall just leave it like that but i just want to pick up on something that uh, saturios has said about the contraceptive pill because Wearing my woman's hour hat, which I always listen to carefully, even if I can't do it during the day at broadcast time, I do it on catch up. There's been a lot of bad press recently uh, related to this documentary by an American woman who's basically sort of portraying the pill as being terribly bad for you. And I just wanted to emphasize that what Soterios was very correctly saying was that sometimes the contraceptive pill, because it stops you cycling in the same way, uh, will change the appearances of your ovary on ultrasound or may change the hormonal pattern. So it's important that you're tested without that uh, influence. But I want to emphasize that there is no data, I want to repeat, no data that says taking the contraceptive pill or using good, reliable, long-acting, reversible contraception in any way uh, detracts from fertility. So I think that's an important point to make. Now, it says, um, I've been referred for fertility treatment for, but have an 18 month wait. Do you have advice for coping with that? Um, uh, and and I, I think also we could say, what's, what's the best advice we can give Ashley, who's asking the question is how she can prepare herself uh, to be in the best possible format. And that, so we can talk about body weight, um, exercise, diet, no, non-smoking, minimizing alcohol, all those sorts of things. So what would your advice to Ashley be? Yes, it's difficult. And a lot of patients that I see in the NHS clinic have had a really long wait wait and they say gosh we've waited so long to see you um i think prof what you mention is make sure that everything is in place by the time your appointment does come around so um, smoking can have adverse effects on fertility both for female and male partners um, bmi body mass index uh, too low of a BMI or too high of a BMI can have an adverse impact, less than 19 or more than 30 in particular. Um, other lifestyle measures, diets, for example, uh, having a healthy diet, often the Mediterranean diet is quoted as having high fiber, protein, lower carbohydrates, less saturated fats. Um, uh, and also sometimes if you're planning for a pregnancy, you, you have to ensure you're doing the basics you're taking folic acid a simple measure such as folic acid can go a very long way um logistically or from a, a bureaucratic point of view it's kind of outside our scope as medical professionals but uh, it is worth advocating for yourself like we we said prof you know making sure that the referrals are taking place making sure that they've been received is there anywhere else that you could be referred to and then of course the final solution um, would be seeking private help i, I think it's worth knowing the criteria for a re, uh, for a region for funding uh, treatment if someone needs them because there's nothing worse than waiting for two years only to be turned away 
and been told that we cannot fund your treatments because then people would say, well, if I'd known, I wouldn't be waiting for my NHS appointment. And then, of course, for you know our patients like Savania helping us try to change the funding and make it broader and drop the waiting times so that everyone can get the treatment they deserve. Absolutely, because what you don't want to do is to spend two valuable years of your reproductive life waiting for something that's never going to happen. Quite yeah. right. Quite right. And I just want to emphasize as well about body mass index, because I think so often patients or ladies that are a bit overweight and they, they, they find it very difficult when I start to talk to them about normalizing it. But it's important to emphasize that, you know, the fat is not it's, it's not just padding. It's it's actually an organ in its own right. And we know that women who are having problems with the regular cycles or even if they're having regular cycles, problems with pregnancy, their ovaries and the metabolism or the way their ovaries work is very affected in some women, particularly women with polycystic ovaries, um, if they're overweight. So doing the uh, weight loss bit um, and the exercise program really does help. And it also means that when you get to the fertility treatment stage, that the um, medications that you're given and the treatment regimen you go on is going to be much, much better, um, what well, is going to be much more effective. And that, of course, is why most IVF units have a, 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 a maximum BMI before they will treat you. And I think that's an important criteria. And often ladies look at me and think, you're being a bit harsh, aren't you? Uh, but I, it really is because I can't do that bit for them. And I just want to ensure that they understand that it will have an impact. I have seen a couple this morning, literally, who, based on the notes, we were waiting to start IVF treatments. Um, and I was preparing myself to go through the process and the risks as well involved and everything that Savani has mentioned. They joined the call and they had a big smile on their face. And I thought, what's going on? And she said, I'm naturally pregnant. So literally through lifestyle interventions, not for everyone, but for, for some women and couples, it can make all the difference. And what I told them, I will kind of echo in this webinar, there is no bigger joy for us as medical professionals when someone achieves pregnancy and success naturally without our help. Um, and I guess the other thing is we, we have to ensure that help is available to achieve that as well. It may not be under our remit as gynecologists, but dietitians and counsellors and all kinds of other health healthcare professionals may be able to assist with that. But it can make all the difference for sure. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's very, very important. And uh... So it's really important. So the there are various other things about, you know, what advice would you give? There's a lady here saying she's got a hydrosalpinx in her left tube and she's waiting for a gynecological appointment and that she's been looking at Google, which has made her probably, she says, well, probably means petrified. So um, mm -hmm. this is a very gray area too, isn't there? So two different clinicians, uh, two gynecological experts in the room and probably three different opinions. So what would you advise this lady? I mean, I know you haven't seen her and you haven't actually seen the x-rays in the imaging, but what would you suggest she does? Yeah, so we, we spoke a bit about endometriosis, for example, or the male factor, often male causes affect about a third of infertile couples. Uh, one of the big causes is uh, problems with the tubes. If the tubes are blocked, then clearly the sperm and the egg will struggle to meet and fertilize. A hydrosalpinx for everyone joining us today um, means water in a tube. So if a tube is blocked, then it can fill up with water and appear on an ultrasound scan as a balloon, essentially. Um, and what can happen is that can become infected and the water can trickle down into the womb and reduce the chances of uh, success in pregnancy in IVF. Even some data in the last 18 months or so has said from the UK, um, from the Birmingham group, have shown that it may increase the risk of miscarriage. Like Professor Regan says, it has to be individualized. So um, one has to look at each individual case, see whether indeed it's the correct diagnosis, it is the tube, and then discuss the pros and cons of having surgery, often by keyhole, to remove a damaged tube. Some cases the tube can be opened up, for example, and then you can try for a natural pregnancy, but that has its own risks. I think the take-home message from this, or I would say two take-home messages, one is individualization. Not every woman in the UK with a block tube will have the exact same block tube. 
with the exact same causes and their scenario will be the same. The second take home, so it has to be individualized. The second take home message, again, be a strong advocate for yourself. If you see someone who's just saying, let's do this or let's operate or you know, not having an open dialogue and you're feeling uncertain about the recommendation, it is absolutely in your right and it's the right thing to do to ask for a second opinion. And I, I often advise patients, you know, to see a colleague of mine so that they can get different opinions because like Professor Regan says, it's often a gray area. It's very rarely black and white in medicine. And uh, once you collect different opinions, uh, then you can see what works best for you and the decision you will make will be the right one for you and someone else will make a different decision that will be the right for them. Very important point, Sotirios, because uh, i am always been a believer that you go to a doctor who's upset that you've asked for a second opinion. Uh -huh. Oh, no. <laughs> um, because, then, again, it's really, really important to accept challenges and to learn from them. And I uh, really important not just for the patient but also for the healthcare professionals as well um so you said Therese has mentioned several different options for this hydrosalpinks and um I, i'm of an age now where i've seen this go through vogues we know we used to always try and drain them and now we know that if the architecture of the fimbrial ends at the end of the tube are very damaged that's probably not going to be of benefit and then there was a a 10 year sort of fad for clipping them so that the the fluid couldn't leap back down into the wound cavity after the embryo transfer and now I think quite a few uh, clinicians think that you should remove the tube and then more recently I heard someone saying well you don't want to remove the tube because you might remove some of the blood supply to the ovary so you see it's still a grey area um, and I think that if the doctor that you see in the fertility unit um, presents to you different options but they're probably the one that's really on top of the case and then they can help you to choose what's going to be best for you. Um, there's a lot more questions and um, Suvania can I turn to you again and um, not necessarily to quiz you about the questions but to um, raise any other issues that you'd like to ensure that you shared with our audience who are obviously very engaged there the, the questions are tumbling in I can't do justice to them all. I think it's what Dr. Saturio said right at the beginning, that every case is individualized. Um, we must also remember that research doesn't, and this, the stats that come out of research don't necessarily apply to every single patient. It's, there's so many factors and so many variables in that research. You are your advocate. Um, you need to advocate for yourself. If something doesn't feel right in your body, um, you need to use your initiative to make sure that you get the best possible treatment to get the best possible outcome. That would be the first thing to advocate for yourself. The second thing is to be kind. And thirdly, when going into any type of fertility discussion, to try and be transparent with those around you um, and try and make and try and ensure that you have mechanisms of support in place so that you are best prepared when going into this treatment. Thank you. Um, there's a question here about as a single woman who wants a child but isn't in a relationship, can the NHS support IVF or will I need to pay privately? It's very hard to find information. So first of all, I want to reply to the questioner, if I may, that this is one of the areas where the women's health strategy team are determined to change the, the current um, availability of treatment and so for um, a single woman wanting to um, have fertility treatment it will be possible not this week but we're, we're preparing ways in which we can organize for the integrated care uh, systems or boards to provide for this in the future um, and also for same-sex couples that, which has got an identical point but there that's two, uh, two, two other two women or two men um, who want to have a child and they have to therefore find uh, um, uh, they have to source IVF either for themselves or uh, with a surrogate so that is that is, if you like, in the pipeline, and I hope that it won't be too long before I'm running another seminar with Saturios and telling you that it's all there and sorted. But I want to reply here about the hard to find information. And I think the most useful thing that I ever do for the ladies that, or the couples that come and see me about fertility treatment is ask them to go onto the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority's website, the hfea.gov.uk. And one of the well-being teams is going to put that in the chat for everybody to see. 
uh, because it is the most impressive source of patient information. So I often say to them, look, I can sit here and talk to you for the next five hours, but it will be much, much more useful for you to spend that time on the HFEA website. It's beautifully put together how they inform patients. And they also teach that couple how to look through and interpret all the statistics that these uh, clinics will ply you with. So you know they will explain to you how it doesn't really matter how many positive pregnancy tests there are. It only matters how many live take home babies they achieve because you can have a positive pregnancy which up with disappears or it may sadly lead to a miscarriage. So it's just interpreting the data, because remember that when you go into this, into your IVF clinic, you are very vulnerable. And this is a very emotional issue. So unlike when, you're, when, you're, when your knee hurts or your liver's unwell, uh, then you sort of say, I want to see the evidence for will this treatment work, particularly if you're praying for it privately, um, you wouldn't accept it. But because it's so emotional, uh, every, many couples will get sucked into doing things and thinking, oh, well, I'll just try anyway. So really important, hfea.gov.uk. It really is so important. And thanks so much, Wellbeing Team. You've put it into the chat there uh, with, the, with the link. So, Savania, did you find the HFEA website? I know that you possibly you had your treatment in South Africa, but knowing some of my fertility colleagues in South Africa, they were always quoting the HFEA to their patients. So. Did you find absolutely. absolutely? I found that incredibly useful. And I think that you put it so poignantly. It's not the number of pregnancy tests, it's the number of live births. And I can't emphasize enough that you will be overwhelmed with the amount of information out there. So it's definitely a brilliant use of your time to actually understand what you're looking for and um, what are the key markers of success. Um, and just to, to ensure that you are best prepared, best positioned before you go into this procedure. Lovely. Thanks, Savania. Beautifully put. There, be, there are several questions you will see in the chat also about recurrent implantation failure and also about miscarriage. And here I think I'm going to jump on my hobby horse because I've always maintained having a particular interest in repeated miscarriages, how the data that's been undertaken in very lengthy and sometimes very tortuous treatment trials and uh, intervention trials for recurrent miscarriage are often automatically assume that you can extrapolate them back and that they will be the same for the woman who's having recurrent implantation failure, either with spontaneous conceptions or uh, with the fertility treatment. And that just isn't the case. I mean, there are more studies than there were previously, and Sotirios may want to chip in here in a moment, but you know, it's, it's a mistake to think that it's the same thing. So uh, I would say to you, and that's why I think the HFEA website is so valuable, that they do actually address lots of things, for example, alternative therapies, um, some of which may be helpful in terms of relaxing you, others may be actually counterproductive. I mean, my personal prejudice is that Chinese herbs does do such extraordinary things to the endometrium. Why would you want to take them when you don't actually know what's in them? Whereas I meet a lot of women who tell me that acupuncture gave them enormous um, help, uh, as did reflexology in terms of relaxing them and that they found that helpful. So I, I'm not advocating for them, just saying, you know, make sure that they're not going to do any harm first. Um, but also, I just want to make a plug about the many, many patients I see who've gone through fertility treatment and IVF units where they've been asked to do very expensive immune testing. Um, and there's a very nice section on the HFEA website about what the evidence is for this and there isn't very much evidence at all um, and all I would say to you is of course you are at liberty if you want to go and do those tests but do read the evidence beforehand um, and so that you really are well informed before you spend a lot of time and and well before you're going to a costly investigative process not just financially but emotionally as well. So Tyrios, would you like to make some comments? Because I'm sure you have, like me, masses of patients who want to, you to comment on this. Yes, it's such an important topic. I think we live in the era of fake news or people worrying about fake news. And I think in the medical field, uh, having a broadcaster that you can trust, which is the HFEA, is absolutely invaluable. And the HFEA indeed is independent um, and it's the watchdog of fertility treatment and information. 
And I think at the heart of the HFEA is trying to protect patients from um, from harm. And that's why they have this traffic light system, which essentially gives recommendations about treatment, whether they um, there's evidence behind them or not. And I think my thoughts are very often it's it's much more difficult to not give treatment as a doctor than it is to give treatment. And I think sometimes um, in our field, patients are so vulnerable, you, you have to protect them against treatment that not only may not work, not only may it be costly, but may cause harm. And because there's no evidence, or if there's a lack of evidence at the moment, it doesn't mean that we should just try them out and see what happens. Because if in five years time or 10 years time, if the evidence shows that they've, they've caused harm, then, you know, I think everyone would look back with regret. So I, I echo all those points. And, uh, and again, I think because a lot of our patients are vulnerable, we should go the extra mile to make sure that they have evidence-based treatment or that we present um, all the options with the evidence. And there's a lot of organizations, the European Society of Human Reproduction Embryology, all the way from Asia, Europe, all the way to Canada, there's societies with recommendations um, which are backed with um, papers and studies and evidence. And, you know, I guess that's the medical professional's job to discuss these with each individual and help them make an informed choice. Exactly, because information is power. And the more information you have, the more empowered you are. And to use your words, Suvani, the more agency you have to dictate what's happening to you. And usually, I think, to have uh, the outcome, the best outcome as well. I just make a little comment about vitamins as well, because I see women almost every day of my clinical life where who've been uh, asking me, well, should this vitamin, was it, was, is it important to take this or is it important? Well, what about fish oils and coenzyme Q and, you know, and the, the list goes on and on. So Soterius mentioned earlier, but it's never too often to talk about the benefits of folic acid. So folic acid um, and also vitamin D supplements because most of us in the northwest hemisphere are a bit sunshine depleted so they are really useful um, and the others I don't think there's a lot of evidence for them uh, over and above having a sensible balanced diet but what I would say is if you're going to buy vitamins please go to the local pharmacy and buy the the generic brand don't spend lots of money because basically someone's making money out of the packaging and the colors on, on the tablets. And they're no different from the ones that you can get in Boots or Lloyd's Pharmacy. Uh, just buy the cheapest version uh, and that will be the that will be the best. So, um, Sivania, just as we wrap up now, we've got a few moments left. Um, anything else that you'd like to share with us about going forward and, and you know, what you, your, what your plans are for the future? Um... I think going forward, I'm I'm just really grateful um, to have had 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 the exposure to the people that I did during this process. And I think my one objective after going through IVF is to just leave every place better than I find it, um, and to try and humanize some topics that have so much of taboo and stigma to attach to them. And I think my last message to everyone would just be: be kind to yourself, be kind to each other and try to be transparent as you can be. Um, and I think coming out of a COVID pandemic that's now become an endemic, um, we really just need to work together and try and rectify some of the challenges that COVID brought in. And I think one of the things that disturbed me the most was that a lot of the good work that was done in women's health, not just in Europe, but especially in emerging markets like Africa have now been, we've now gone 10 steps back because of the impact that COVID has. It's really important for us to use our voices and to be the change that we want to see. Very much so. And that reminds me to mention something else that I know that during the COVID pandemic, one of the things that was quite wrongly said was that often doctors and nurses were in the fertility world were told that this wasn't a priority fertility treatment. And I think the pushback on that against that was actually featured very strongly in the Women's Health Strategy Report, that actually this is an illness just like anything else. This is not an optional extra. Uh, when, when we've got a stable economy, this is something that really affects the quality um, uh, of people's lives. And it's really very important to understand that point. Um, so, Tyrios, now what for you going forward? 
you're going to take us to great heights, aren't you, uh, at the Hammersmith uh, and St Mary's Fertility Unit? What do you think are going to be the real highlights uh, and, and the, the challenges for us ahead? Uh, I think for, for us, or the way I see things moving forward, I think collaboration is going to be key because I genuinely think that people like Savan here can make a very big difference. Um, and I think it starts from our patients um, to us on the, on the hospital floor, um, all the way up to the policy makers, but everyone has to be on the same page. Um, and I think if all of us work towards equality in, um, in fertility treatment, um, having policies in place in the workplace, and if there's any senior member and the, the participants, a manager or a boss, you know, discuss with your employees, make sure there's a policy in place uh, in your workplace. Um, and I think it, it, it's, it's not something that just concerns the hospitals or the units, it concerns everyone. And like I say, we've got a bill underway and I think we need to get behind that and so many others as well to follow. Um, but, you know, I'm really glad to take part in such events because it, it shows that it's not just doctors, um, not just hospitals or individuals, everyone, you know, everyone should work together. And I think that's how you can have the biggest impact. Thank you. Well, you've given me the wonderful shoe in to my favourite comment always, and that is that we need to make women, our patients, part of the solution. And that was my mantra when I was writing the Better for Women report, just as I finished my presidency at the RCOG. And I think it's also something that's been picked up in the women's health strategy. You won't be surprised to hear because I kept talking about it. And I think it really is important. You know, there's one healthcare ambassador, apparently, for women, and that's me. Um, but we've got, what, 62 million people in this world and uh, in our country, rather, and over half of them are women. So we need to have all those ambassadors uh, pushing it forward and uh, and improving women's health. And this is one very important aspect of it. So I think that um, I'm going to have to wrap this up because otherwise the, the, the wellbeing team will get all terribly cross with me. But can I leave you to say that by saying that it's a real privilege to be chairing this charity. Wellbeing of Women is the only research, uh, charity that funds uh, research and ed education and advocacy into every aspect of women's health, literally from cradle to grave. Um, and uh, I think it's really so important to support them. So please, to anyone um, in the audience today, please go onto our website and donate to our give Big Give appeal. And Savania, I'm going to invite you, if you will, please, to keep in touch with us closely. And one of our, our big um, changes in the last couple of years since I took up the chair was to ensure that we are doing a lot more in advocacy and education for women to empower them. And as you said, give them agency. And I think that uh, we are determined that we're going to make our website a really, really valuable source of information, by which I don't mean rewriting all the stuff that's out there on the Internet, but being a really, really good signposter. So I'm going to recruit you, if I may. I've got you as a captive audience here, haven't I? Uh, I'm going to recruit you to help us do that and help us identify uh, by or the team in the office to help us identify which will be the most useful signposting tools. So with that, I'm going to thank everybody for coming today and for contributing in the chat. Um, we will look at the other questions that we haven't had the time to uh, address, and we will try to get back to you for that, with that rather. And I want to thank Savania again for her bravery and for her generosity to her fellow woman um, by sharing her story. It's not easy to do these sorts of things. And she's done it with great composure and with great compassion, I think, as well. And I think anyone who's listened to Satyrios today will know why I'm so thrilled that I can now introduce him, not as a trainee or a, a, a medical, um, a, an MD student, um, but as my consultant colleague. And I'm sure that... Uh, Yes, I'm sure that he's going to go from strength to strength, and I'm sure he will be helping me run many more webinars like this in the future for well-being of women. So please go onto the website, well-being of women, and give as generously as you possibly can. The funding is going to help someone that you love and you care for. So thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.